Among the proponents of a naturalistic origin of morality, it is commonly argued that the perception of right and wrong is solely derived from evolution, with little to no influence from logic or reason. Through the study of evolution, we have come to understand the phrase survival of the fittest does not merely refer to survival of the strongest. By examining animal behavior, particularly that which belongs to interdependent social groups, we find the fittest group refers to members that best cooperate with one another and that show the greatest respect for social hierarchy, allowing them to attain mutual goals that would otherwise be difficult or impossible for the individual to achieve on his or her own. However, an unfortunate reality of life's ruthless struggle for existence is that the goal of one group is often the demise of another. Therefore, despite the understanding that natural selection favors animals that behave in certain ways in order to achieve a collective goal, that alone does not lead to a consistent and mutually beneficial code of conduct. As we will see, there is much to be learned from how animals socially interact with one another. However, without the ability to reason, we would not have the necessary tools to elevate our understanding of right and wrong beyond that of lower order animal species thus preventing us from constructing a moral philosophy that equally applies to all human beings. Imagine one evening you are sitting at home with your wife and children when there is a knock at the door. You get up to see who it is, and you're immediately confronted by a man that is much bigger, stronger, and younger than yourself. Suddenly, he begins to threaten and beat you. Severely injured, he casts you outside your home, where you lay helpless as he proceeds to murder your children and then rape your wife. Can you label the actions of the intruder as immoral? Are human beings unique on this planet for our capacity to commit such abhorrent acts on one another? As you ponder these questions, let's turn for a moment to the African savanna, the birthplace of mankind and home to some of the most spectacular life on planet Earth. Within this beautiful wilderness, the scenario of the home intruder has been played out countless times over hundreds of millions of years. Challenges over mating and territorial rights are some of the oldest conflicts on the planet, and such displays can be found in almost every animal species throughout the world although the severity of such confrontations can vary. However, within Africa's lion population, skirmishes can be of a particularly cruel and ruthless nature. When a solitary male lion enters the territory of an established male with a pride of females and offspring, the younger, more virile male will often produce a challenge for territorial and breeding rights. A vicious confrontation ensues, and if the older male cannot perform his duty by holding his ground and protecting the group, then he will be cast from his pride, where he will eventually die alone due to starvation without the female's aid in catching prey. Upon assuming command of the pride, the lion must kill all the cubs of the previous male, so the females will be receptive to mate, and thereby focusing all resources to raising the offspring of the new male. Are we able to judge the actions of this lion? By human standards, the lion has committed several of the most heinous crimes known to mankind. However, since the lion is acting in accordance with his nature, should we then consider nothing at all to be wrong with his actions? Could we even go so far as to consider his actions to be moral? It is common for the proponents of a naturalistic code of conduct to point to the animal kingdom as the origins of human morality. Often, vicious predators such as the shark or piranha are referenced in order to lend support to the notion that despite being in a mindless feeding frenzy, there is still some semblance of moral conduct, for these predators have evolved to not turn on one another. Piranhas, ruthless pack killing machines, right? But notice, even in the feeding frenzy, they don't kill each other. Piranhas do not believe in a god, yet they don't do whatever they want. Where do these ruthless killing machines get their moral code about not killing each other from? But is the fact that carnivores such as piranhas, crocodiles, and sharks do not eat one another really evidence of the evolution of morality? Perhaps, but imagine what would happen if a shark is unfortunate enough to be found bleeding amongst a group of his hungry peers. Sharks or piranha are known to attack one another at the sign of weakness or injury. 
In fact, it can be argued the reason these carnivores do not turn on healthy members of their own species is because they are not seen as a potential meal until signs of weakness are evident. Therefore, sharks do not show concern for the helpless. Indeed, the helpless are taken advantage of and preyed upon. Can this really be considered moral behavior? Piranhas, sharks, and lions are not the only animals known to turn on members of their own species in times of weakness, territorial disputes, or for mating rights. Our closest relative within the animal kingdom, chimpanzees, have also been observed going to war, attacking, and even cannibalizing their rivals. Wolves are another variety of social mammal that must prey on other animals in order to maintain their own survival. Carnivores such as these are more than capable of killing each other if they so desire, but they do not. In fact, quite the opposite. In order for animals like wolves and wild African dogs to be successful in hunting exclusively from a food source that is much larger and faster than themselves, they must learn to work together within a cooperative, interdependent group. But not only are pack animals cooperative hunters, they care for one another and dutifully adhere to an established pack hierarchy as well. Collective caring for the young is a behavior not only observed in carnivorous pack animals, but also in the prey these animals hunt. Oxen are known to stand guard and risk personal injury in order to protect the young of their herd, even in cases where the young are not their direct offspring. It is to the benefit of the group as a whole that individuals behave in certain ways, even when such behavior is not advantageous to the individual. The reason we observe social animals protecting one another rather than attacking and killing members of their own group is not because they have a religious text directing their behavior. Rather, if the genes were not in place that deterred group infighting and encouraged obedience to social guidelines, then the species would have no chance of survival and thus would no longer exist for us to observe. For all we know, there could have been many different variations of social behavior that arose throughout the course of animal evolution. However, natural selection favored those animals that best cooperated with and cared for one another. And it is these traits that have found their way into modern day species, among them animals that flock, herd, run in packs, and even group together within communities. And now let me show you how I uh, introduced the concept of uh, evolution and morality to my uh, undergraduate students. So imagine that you were there way back then, and I ask you, uh, please list for me the traits that you associate with moral perfection. <laughs> What's that? Honesty. Honesty. What's that? Oh, you guys are so shy. Yeah. Altruism. Altruism. Loyalty. Loyalty. Compassion. Compassion. Friendship. Friendship. I play this all around the world. It's always the same. I knew what you were going to say. <laughs> Tell us the traits that you associate with pure evil. Greed, murder, prejudice. You guys are no fun. I'm going to go to a Baptist church. Indeed, same list happens each and every time. Okay, so now with these two sort of stereotype caricatures of the good and evil individual, I want to perform three thought experiments. So number one, what would happen if you put a good person and an evil person together on a desert island? <laughs> the good person will die? I read your lips. <laughs> That's right, the good person will become shark food within days. And so again, simple but profound. We're making light, but this is, this is simple but profound. There is something about the traits that we associate with goodness that is inherently vulnerable to the traits that we associate with evil. Okay? This is very, very important. The second thought experiment. What would happen if you put a group of good people on one island and a group of evil people on another island and we have the islands far apart so there's no transfer between islands? What will happen then? The good people thrive. The good people thrive. This is not a trick question. The good people thrive. They, they build a boat to escape the island or they build a little paradise on earth while the evil group will 
self-destruct. And so you, again, simple but profound. And just, it's, just as it is true that goodness is vulnerable to evil within any given social group, it is equally true that, that groups of organisms, not just people, but organisms, and behave in the way that we associate with goodness, will survive and reproduce in purely biological terms better than groups who behave in ways that we associate with evil. In purely Darwinian terms. It is undeniable that life as we know it relies on the working relationships we have with other members of our local community and even the world at large. The place you live, what you eat, the clothes you wear, how you earn money and where you spend it is entirely dependent on the efforts of other human beings. And more than likely, many other people are dependent on you as well. The very success of our species is invested at the genetic level in the hardwiring of our brains encouraging us toward group cooperation, obedience, empathy, and even conformity. Indeed, our desire to be accepted by others and to be included in the group is so ingrained in our psyche that it can even lead to negative and often destructive behavior. The ASH experiment is one of psychology's oldest and most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in the real test, which is actually about group conformity. Please begin. The experiment you will be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So, for example, if you the actors have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is two. Uh, one. 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 <laughs> two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 The ASH experiment has been repeated many times, and the results have been uh, supported again and again. We will conform to the group. Again, we're very social creatures. We're very much aware of what the people around us think. Uh, we want to be liked. We don't want to be seen to rock the boat, so we will go along with the group. Even if we don't believe what people are saying, we'll still go along. One. 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 Group dynamics is one of the most powerful forces in human psychology. Uh, one. Not only can the herd mentality produce bizarre alterations in behavior, it can even be used against us with devastating consequences, such as in the case of fervent nationalism that results in the loss of identity. A decade earlier, psychologist Stanley Milgram had also looked at how we respond to authority. In order to understand how people were induced to obey unjust regimes and participate in atrocities such as the Holocaust, he set up an experiment. Volunteers were told they were taking part in scientific research to improve memory. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher. Learn. Teacher. Separated by a screen, the teacher would ask the learner questions in a word game and administer an electric shock when the answer was incorrect. He was told to increase the voltage with each wrong answer. Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, wrong. 150 volts. Answer, horse. Oh. Experiment, that's all. Get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. Right. I refuse to go on. Let me out. You refuse to go on. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor, and the so-called shocks harmless. You're going to get a shock. 180 volts. 
Two-thirds of volunteers were prepared to administer a potentially fatal electric shock when encouraged to do so by what they perceived as a legitimate authority figure. In this case, a man in a white coat. 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fellow in there. I don't get no answer. He was hollering with less voltage. Can't you check in and see if he's all right, please? Milgram's findings horrified America. They showed that decent American citizens were as capable of committing acts against their conscience as the Germans had been under the Nazis. Despite the potential for abuse inherent within the herd mentality, if our earliest ancestors had not maintained a social structure that included cooperation, conformity, and obedience to social hierarchy, then our species would have long ago arrived at an evolutionary dead end. Although we live in a world of survival of the fittest, there would be no survival if members of the group turned on each other and allowed one's selfish desires to dictate their actions. Now I want to tell you about a real experiment. This is um, work done by my colleague, a poultry scientist named uh, William Muir at where else? Purdue University. And Bill Muir wanted to breed a more productive strain of hens. Hens have always lived in uh, flocks and groups. Nowadays they live in cages, I'm sorry to uh, report. And so both experiments involved multiple cages of hens. And in the first experiment, the most productive hen within each cage was chosen to breed the next generation of hens. In the second experiment, the most productive cages were chosen, and all of the hens in those cages were chosen to breed the next generation of hens. Now you might think that these experiments are similar, and that the first one might work better because after all it's individuals that lay eggs so why not pick the most productive individuals? Wouldn't it be less efficient to, to select the best groups which after all might have some unproductive hands? But the results told a completely different story. Here is the result of the first experiment after six generations. And what we see here is three hens, not the original nine because the other six have been murdered. And these three survivors have plucked each other in their incessant attacks on themselves. Egg productivity plummeted over the course of six generations, even though the most productive hen was chosen each and every generation. And so what happened? The most productive hens achieved their productivity by suppressing the productivity of the other hens in their groups. Evolution is a relative process. It's always who reproduces, not in any absolute sense, but who survives and reproduces better than who. And so uh, Muir had selected the meanest hen in each group, and after six generations had produced a nation of psychopaths. <laughs> Here is the result of the second experiment. After six generations of selecting at the group level, this is now like the second uh, um, thought experiment. Now we have nine happy and healthy uh, hens. I call these your Mr. Rogers hens here. They're, they want to be your neighbor. And, uh, and uh, egg productivity uh, shot up 160% in six generations because he was selecting for traits that not only caused individuals to thrive, but also facilitated or at least didn't interfere with the productivity of one's uh, neighbors. And I think that this is, you know, there's so many messages in this. One of the messages is what counts as an individual trait? When we see people, for example, that are thriving and we think that's a, you know, that's their property as an individual. We're so individualistic in the way we're thinking. And so, but what we really need to remember in ourselves in addition to these hens is that when an individual is thriving or languishing as an individual, that can be a product of social interactions that have been taking on a long, long. So what seems to be an individual trait, in fact, as in this case, can be a uh, social uh, trait. Throughout popular culture is spread a misconception about survival of the fittest, where the most ruthless and cutthroat members of a given society, or even corporations within a capitalistic economy, are encouraged to trample over the weak, with the aim of becoming even wealthier and more successful. What's the combination? Well, it's not my birthday. You started to regret that day, I imagine, Father. Try 12-2-1809. 
Darwin's birthday. Survival of the fittest. However, in the context of a social animal, the phrase survival of the fittest does not imply survival of the strongest. The term fittest refers to individuals that best work together, that care for one another and help each other survive. This creates the conditions for a fit community, whose members can go on to perpetuate their genes and bring about the next generation. If the concept of survival of the fittest were merely the strongest male or female going around consuming all the resources and murdering their rivals, then the group as a whole would not be very fit. As we have just seen in the previous experiment, such groups are unsustainable, and as infighting continues, the group will self-destruct in a matter of generations. However, a fine line must be walked when one's survival, or the survival of the group, is placed in jeopardy. In certain situations, it may be evolutionarily advantageous to eliminate rival groups in order to gain further access to contested resources. Although it was essential for our early ancestors to show kindness to members of their own group, if they were to survive and successfully compete against other hostile groups, then they must not become docile and lose their predatory edge. The tendency toward aggressive behavior has been retained in us at a genetic level. Mind you, the same aggression that has been bred out of wolves, resulting in the infantile lapdogs we often treat as our children. It is for this reason there appears to be a conflicting duality within human behavior, exhibiting both altruistic tendencies as well as those of a violent and predatory nature. Although it might be difficult to face the hard facts about our origins, if we were to truly understand who we are and from whence we've come, we must acknowledge our violent past and our place within the animal kingdom. Human beings, like other social animals, are both the products of their environment as well as their genes. The concepts of nature and nurture govern every aspect of our social interactions, and they're at the root of violent and aggressive behavior. In many impoverished regions throughout the world, orphan children that are abandoned to the street often turn to a life of crime, becoming murderers at a very early age. Because there's no strong parental influence to teach them right from wrong, many of these children have no concept of human life and think nothing of murdering someone over a stick of gum or a pair of shoes. In addition, children that have been mentally or physically abused often regress into a feral state, lashing out at their parents, siblings, and peers. Where's your birth, where's your birth father? What's he doing? He's right there, and there's his hand. His hand's right there. Where? Right there. You can't hardly really see it because it's green. What's it touching? My vagina. And what is your birth father doing? Heart nut. Your face looks uh, sad. Can you tell me about that? Mm-hmm. It's crying because that's thoughts of the tears. Beth had endured severe neglect and abuse as a child. Her birth mother died when she was one. Because of these early childhood experiences, Beth never developed a sense of conscience, love, or trust for anyone. The early sexual abuse by her birth father would cause her to exhibit inappropriate sexual behavior, especially toward her brother. Does your brother have private parts? Um, yeah. Yeah? What, are the, what is his private parts? Penis and butt. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with your brother with his private parts, Ben? I hurt it. Tell me about it. What do you do? Now, I pinch it, um, squeeze it, um, kick it. When you do things to your brother's private parts, what does he say? Stop. Okay, tell me that. Well, he says stop, but I don't stop. Do you hurt him? Mm-hmm. A lot. Okay. And would you like to do that to other boys? <laughs> when I, I caught her with Jonathan one morning, she was molesting him. Um, he was crying and his pants were down, and I said, Beth, what's happening? And she said, I pulled his penis and put my finger up his anus. And uh, I said, didn't he say to stop? And she said, yeah, he did. 
And I said, did you? And she said, no. Have you ever rubbed your private parts? Mm-hmm. Do you do it a lot? A lot. How much do you do that? About every single day, and that since I did it every single day until it got well bad and I stopped and I had to go to the doctor and I did not like it. What What do you mean by real bad? Well, it looked real raw, got all kinds of boogers on it, germs, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff from my hand. And it bled? Mm-hmm. Julie, how often would your daughter masturbate? Daily. Constantly. Do you have animals, Beth? Four of them. And what do you do to the animals, Beth? Stick them with pants. Do you stick them a little bit or a lot? A lot. What are you trying to do to the animals, Beth? Kill them. What do they do when you stick them with the pins? Well, Annie cries. She's a dog. The repercussions of Beth's tragic childhood led to uncontrollable rage. Despite the love and nurturing of her adoptive parents, she took this rage out on herself, on her brother, and on them. Her acts of violence became more and more cruel and frightening. What did you think she might do with the knives? My first thought was Jonathan. Uh, and the reason we thought that was that she had, by this time, she had tried to kill John on several occasions and, and openly admitted that. In the basement, she was hitting his head against a cement floor. I heard his screams and ran down and had to literally pull her hands off, and she looked wild-eyed. And what if Mom didn't stop you? What would you have done? Kept on doing it. And what about, what about... After evaluating the extent of Beth's psychological problems, Dr. McGid felt that for the well-being of the family, Beth needed to be temporarily separated from them. In April of 1989, her parents brought her to a special home with an expert at raising children with early attachment disorders, especially children who are dangerous to themselves and others. I have children that have killed numerous times. Cold-blooded family members, neighbor children, killed them. And they can do it. Makes my blood run cold just thinking about nine years old. People don't think a nine-year-old is capable of cold-blooded murder, but they are. That attachment break does severe damage to the heart, the ability to care and the ability to love. If they don't care and they don't love, they're capable of anything. We're very strict, very strict about everything. Everything is completely monitored. We take complete control because a child who's unattached does not trust. And because they don't trust, they don't allow anybody to be boss of them. So we take complete control. They are not boss of anything. They have to ask to get a drink of water. They have to ask to go to the bathroom. They have to ask to leave our sight. Part of that is because we cannot trust them because of the damage that they've done before. Several months into treatment in this controlled environment, Beth had made progress, and her therapist decided to loosen some of the controls. Anybody want some more? I can Beth continued to show signs of improvement. She began to develop a sense of right and wrong. She seemed to respond to affection, was more outgoing. She went to public school, made friends at the local church, and even sang in the choir. In the beginning, we couldn't trust her with anything. She was locked up at night. We had alarms on the door at night, so she wasn't sneaking around doing things with the other children. We don't worry about that anymore. There's no alarm on her door at night now. She sleeps in the same room with my own daughter, and I trust her that much. She brushes the dogs, and I trust her that much. Because she has earned that trust, she's learned it, she's, she has a heart, and she has a love inside, and she feels bad when she does something now. In the past, because she didn't have a conscience, she didn't feel anything when she did something bad. There was just no feeling there. And now she does feel bad, and it shows in her face. I believe that Beth can make it. She's got a really bright mind. She's got a good heart now, which has done a lot of healing. She's got a really super set of parents. They're powerful, they're knowledgeable, they're motivated. Um, she's done a lot of good work with you in therapy, with Canal and with myself. She wants to heal. 
And that's the number one key. And she wants to heal because she has a family that really cares about her. And she wants to be with them. The psychological development of children is so important that if nurtured improperly, they require months and perhaps even years of rehabilitation. As we can see, the morals and values of a society must be taught, and those who have not had the benefit of this instruction early in life risk never being able to assimilate within that society at all. However, nature plays an equal, if not more important role than nurture, a fact that has been experimentally demonstrated in the process of animal domestication. Fifty years ago, Soviet scientists set up a breeding program to try and domesticate silver foxes. The scale of the project has opened a remarkable window on domestication. It's become a focal point for scientists across the world. Here, on a farm outside the city of Novosibirsk, the experiment still continues today overseen by Dr. Ludmilla Trut. The breeding program began in 1959, when the first foxes were selected from local fur farms. We approached the animals in the cages and recorded their reaction to us. We could see that some of the foxes showed aggressive behavior. Others were frightened but only 1% of them showed neither signs of fear or aggression. This 1% was selected to become the founding generation of a new population of foxes. At every generation, the selection process was repeated, with only the tamest foxes being allowed to breed. Within just three generations, the aggressive behavior began to disappear. The radical changes came through in the eighth generation, when foxes started to seek contact with humans and show affection to them. The amazing thing was that cubs, who had just started to crawl, opened their eyes and started showing affection to humans by breathing heavily, wagging their tails and howling. This kind of response was a big surprise to us. Half a century on, the 50th generation of foxes are tamer than ever. It's an accelerated model of how dogs might have been domesticated from wolves. But tame foxes alone cannot unravel the mystery of domestication. A parallel group of silver foxes have also been bred to retain their aggressive behavior. It just bit my hand. I didn't even open the cage. I just put my hand up, and it managed to bite me through the bars. This isn't a fox. It's a dragon. It's allowed researchers to make unique comparisons between tame and aggressive foxes. We did an experiment with cross-fostering where we gave aggressive cubs to tame mothers, and vice versa. We found out that the mother's behavior does not influence that of the cub. This cub was brought up by a tame mother. It showed something remarkable, that the difference between tame and aggressive foxes is largely in their genes. We even took the experiment one stage further and transplanted embryos from aggressive mothers into tame mothers. But the results were the same. It proved that you can't change the gene of aggressiveness 
and it will be kept and preserved for the next generation. Geneticists have already located several genetic regions responsible for tameness. They're now taking blood samples from tame and aggressive foxes in an attempt to pinpoint the specific genes. Even though embryos attained from aggressive foxes were transplanted into docile females, the resultant offspring still displayed aggression. As we can see, a large part of combative and violent behavior is invested at the genetic level. Regardless of the environment in which we live, we are ultimately a product of the genes that make us. Like many varieties of social animal, groups of early hominids benefited by working together and adhering to an expected way of behavior. It is these traits that have been passed on by the reproductively successful members of every generation. But despite evolving the tendency to work toward a common goal, often the goal of one group was the demise of another. Human history is fraught with endless battles, wars, and even genocides. However, the same thing that makes human beings such efficient, ruthless killers also allows us to transcend the negative aspects of our animalistic nature. Our intelligence not only provides us with the ability to design an efficient war machine, it allows us to empathize with the enemy as well. Our intelligence also provides us with the necessary tools to engage in scientific inquiry, enabling us to examine the various psychological and physiological states of human well-being through which we may construct a sound moral philosophy that is applicable to everyone. Homo sapiens are the first species on Earth to take hold of the reins of their own evolution. Instead of being subject to the laws of natural selection, where traits best suited for survival are selected by the environment, human beings have selected the environment that best suits their survival. This ability allows us to reshape the world as we see fit, both in our habitat and the way we interact with one another. By adapting our moral behavior to the environment that we have made for ourselves, we are no longer held hostage to the aggressive traits that dominated the lives of our early ancestors, who traversed hostile environments in which violent competition over limited resources meant life or death. We are in the unique position of being able to cast aside these vestigial behaviors by embracing science and technology, providing us with the opportunity to glimpse the height of human well-being that is possible to achieve if only we can successfully apply what we learn about ourselves. If we are to subdue the negative aspects of our psychology, such as the herd mentality that results in the willingness to harm others when authoritatively directed to do so, then we must elevate our understanding of what it means to be moral adhering to these principles with confidence and resolute conviction. By employing the tool of scientific investigation, we've discovered much about human behavior, as well as the mechanisms of action that produce alterations in our physiology. As discussed in the previous episode, medical science is able to determine what actions most effectively promote states of human well-being. The standard of behavior by which we experience health, happiness, liberty, growth, and prosperity are empirically confirmed, and for the vast majority of society that shares these common goals, the decision to follow the objective standard of secular morality is an easy one. As we have seen throughout this presentation, the consequences of infighting and disobedience of authority, abuse and improper nurturing of the young, a failure to cooperate and share resources or information, as well as infringing on the autonomy of others and the denial of well-being, results in the self-destruction of social groups and, inevitably, the very extinction of the species. By examining the behavior of other animals, we can see that both the desire to care for others and the capacity to kill are derived from our evolutionary origins. However, a consistent, all-encompassing code of conduct can only be achieved by employing the tools of science, logic, and reason. Although we have evolved the intellectual prowess to transcend certain aspects of our nature, there are other facets of our evolution to which we are forever bound. Our emotions and the instinctual drive to abstain from and engage in certain types of behavior is an intrinsic aspect of what makes us human. And even though the monotheistic religions have made concertive efforts to demonize and repress facets of human nature, a mature understanding of our lustful desires 
is just as important to the refinement of a sound moral philosophy as the preservation of individual autonomy and the promotion of well-being.